Anyone who knows me knows I love music and I take it pretty serious. Uh, I built uh, this speaker you see here and a matching one on the other side. There's a couple subwoofers down here. You can just see the tops of. Uh, with the help of a couple friends, I, I built those. I arranged my office so that my chair is in the prime listening spot, right in, in the middle of those. And I end a lot of days just listening to music. Again, I, I really like it. And I think God's people have always liked music and, and realized, and God realizes how important it is. That's why an entire book of the Bible is the hymn book of the Old Testament. I'm talking about the book of Psalms. Uh, in one sense, you could consider it the original Christian music channel. Well, I hope you like this video over a psalm, and if so, then uh, if you do me a favor and click the thumbs up, uh, leave a comment, I always love that, and or share it on a social media site like Facebook, that would be a huge help. Thanks a lot. All right, I'm guessing that most of us parents at uh, one time when our kids were very young played that age old game of what does, you know, a cow say? And we get our kids to say moo. What does a horse say? What does a chicken, a pig? All of those. And why do we do that? Is it because it is age old and our parents made us, you know, look silly while we were doing that? I'm, like, I'm going to make my kids do it. Uh, whatever the case, uh, I'm guessing we probably never threw in what does a fool say? You know, our kids probably wouldn't know, but you know, if you read Psalm 53, verse 1, it tells us. There it tells us, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. All right, well, that raises several questions, but one of them is one of what I call those wait-a-minute moment questions. And that is because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, whoever says, you fool, will be in danger of the hell of fire. He says, don't say that, and here's David saying it. And what is even more of a wait-a-minute moment, later on in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus says it. He says to the Pharisees, you blind fools. Which is it? Are you supposed to say it or not? Well, the answer to that lies in the definition of that. What is a fool? What, what did it mean in the Old Testament, which would include Jesus' day? You know, for us, when we think of fool, we think of something intellectual, you know, someone who's dumb or stupid or incapable of understanding. Whereas the word means just the opposite. They are totally capable of understanding about God, and they choose not to. It's not an intellectual term. It's a moral term. You see that a fool says in his heart, there is no God. In other words, you know, the evidence is there, but their heart, that willful part of them says, I don't want to accept it. I don't want to believe it. And so they're choosing foolishly to ignore the evidence for God and choose to separate themselves from God, choose to be condemned by God. And so that's why Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, he's in this passage, this section where he's, he's referencing the commandment, do not murder. And he says that also means don't be angry. Don't act in anger toward a, a brother or sister. And one of the things he says then is, you know, don't say you fool, because if you're saying that out of anger, you know, there are people who have chosen not to accept God, okay. But if you say it to someone out of anger, there's an element of, you know, I hope you're in that group. I hope you don't believe in God. I hope you don't accept God. In other words, I hope you go to hell. That's what puts us in danger of the, the fire of hell. And then that's why Jesus is able to say it in Matthew 23 of the Pharisees, because it's true. They have foolishly, hypocritically, that's what that whole chapter is about, is they have foolishly rejected the evidence for God, specifically that Jesus is from God. Why? Well, because they don't like what he has to say. And that's really, you ask the question, why would someone act foolishly like this? Why would someone see the evidence for God and choose to ignore it and say there is no God? Well, the reason is the implications of choosing to accept <laughs> there's a God. If there's a God, he's God, I'm not. That means God's up here, I'm down here in this relationship. I have to surrender to him whatever he says. The Pharisees didn't like that. They didn't like what Jesus said about the kingdom. They didn't like the direction that he was going. So despite all the evidence that said he's from God, they foolishly chose to say he's not. And despite all the evidence for God in general, some people refuse to say he is. They foolishly say there is no God.
And the psalm then brings out the irony of that. You know, they refuse to accept the evidence for what is real, that there's a God. And the result is, verse 5, there they are in great terror where there is no terror. So something that is real, they refuse. Something that isn't real, they're affected by. And that's the irony. If you ignore the evidence for what is real, then you're subject to to what is not in terms of some of the things you can be afraid of here on earth. And even more than that, you're subject to the reality of that decision later. Because you see, you can choose not to accept God, but you can't choose not to accept the consequences, both eternally and here on this earth. You know, you think about it. A person here on this earth, they face a difficult situation. They've got no greater power to help them through that. Whatever they've got, that's what they've got, and so oftentimes they're in distress, they're worrying when they really wouldn't have to. Uh, they, they shouldn't have to if they would accept God. And, and that's something for us to realize as well. You know, we talk about someone who absolutely denies God, but there is a, an application for those of us who do believe in God, you know, to ask, am I truly surrendered, you know, all the way? Yeah, because I, I see times and I think, you know, in my life as well, God, I'm surrendered to you in this area, this area, and this area, but no, I don't want to. I'm not giving up this. Well, that's being foolish as well, because that means I'm not fully surrendered. I'm at the very least missing out on the fullness of this relationship. I'm suffering the consequences of not being surrendered in that area. And it might be, you know, I face these difficulties and I've still got that same worry, that same lack of peace. And definitely when we face something difficult, you know, our immediate reaction, you know, it can throw us. But do I come back? You know, am I able to get to that point of peace? If not, I'm not surrendered, not surrendered to, to God and whatever happens. I, you know, I'm like, OK, if this doesn't turn out this way, that's when I'm still worrying. That's when I'm still, you know, I got to be surrendered. God, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I'm surrendered to you. Then we can have that peace. So. You know, the Bible talks about the fool who says in his heart there is no God. Well, it's also true for any of us. It's foolish to live like there's no God. Whatever we say, if I don't live it out, I'm missing out on what it means to accept God and be surrendered to Him.